I have a special love for First Peter simply because of the context in which he wrote this letter about hope to a people being put to death in many places for their faith. And yet in the middle of all of that, having instructed them on their being born again, he encourages them to lay aside some things that will make their lives even better. And we read that last week in chapter 2, verse 1. A number of things to put off. And something very precious to desire. The sincere milk of the world, of the word. The word is meat and milk to Christians. It has sustenance for everyone. All kinds of folks can eat and drink at this table. And as we do so, something Peter Peter will write in the second letter occurs. If you'll open your testament to 2 Peter 3, 18, this one who believed in desiring the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby actually told a group of Christians to grow. He'd already encouraged them how to do that through the word. But now he says, grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And then he gives us the motivation for that particular activity. To him be glory. And the Greek has ever and ever. My motivation for growing is not to earn a special place in heaven, but to give glory to the one who saved me and is taking me to heaven. Isaiah wrote a lot about giving God glory. In fact, he, Isaiah told us that God made the beast of the field to glorify him. But then Isaiah made an uninteresting statement about God's glory. He said that God would not share his glory with anyone else. That reminds me of thou shalt have no other gods before him, does it you? When I give glory to God, I have to do it in a very special place. In fact, it's the only place where he does get glory. If you'll open your New Testament to Ephesians 3, 20 and 21, you'll find out what Paul man, said about where to give God the glory. To him be glory, where does your Bible say? In the church. Christians have a special opportunity, uh, unlike any other folks, and that's to give God glory in the church. And so we come to my night with a statement from the Apostle Peter that all of these things were to put off, have a motivation. Notice the first word in verse 3, if. If. So be ye have tasted, interesting analogy here, that the Lord is gracious. Have you tasted that? If you understand that you are a forgiven person, really understand how that took place, you have begun to realize that it was God's graciousness that forgave you. The death of his son on the cross did not demand of God that he forgive everybody. But his grace taught us something about being forgiven. Titus was told that the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men. I believe he's referring to the Christ there. Teaching us that denying ungodliness the word of us, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. Titus 2, 11 and 12. God's grace provided a plan 
whereby I could be a forgiven person. I read the 32nd Psalm before I came in here tonight to remind myself of something David said about the blessed man who is a forgiven man. You may not believe what I'm about to say, but I am not perfect. I'm not perfect. And I don't ever think about being a Christian that way. But sadly, I've met Christians who were so unsure that they were saved that when you ask them that question, they would say, well, I hope so. I wonder if they've tasted that the Lord is gracious. Do they really believe that he will forgive them because of the blood, the precious blood of Christ? Surely we can accept that thought if we grow in grace and in the knowledge of what he did. To taste that the Lord is gracious means I understand what he did for me. And I believe it. And I believe I am a forgiven person. Perfect? No. In fact, let's read what John wrote about Christian relationships to God. Brother Scott preached a sermon for us on this the other day. 1 John 1, 7 through 10. He's in class tonight, so let's ask him to read that for us, please. 1 John 1, 7 through 10. If you have a copy of his sermon, I recommend that you don't get one, but it's a great study of this passage. Was that your first sermon here or the second one? Third? I don't know, somewhere. A few weeks ago, anyway. 1 John 1, 7 through 10. A very misunderstood, mistaught passage among many of us. Could I comment on something? If we walk in the light, means we're following his message and we're walking according to his word. It's not some mysterious thing here. We're walking in the light of his message. Go ahead. The Apostle John, number two on your sheet there, the study sheet tonight, indicated that sinless perfection was not the goal. Forgiveness is. Forgiveness is. I am a forgiven man. I was sitting in Max Miller's class years ago, and we were studying First John, and he looked up at us. He was the teacher. <laughs> and all of a sudden he said, I am a good man. Well, all of us sort of gasped a little bit. Well, well that's a kind of a proud thing to say about yourself. But then he explained what he meant. He said, God forgave me. I have, you know, I understand, Max, what you're saying. We are people who have tasted that the Lord is gracious. To whom, he's talking about the Christ here, coming A living stone, as unto is not in the text, to whom coming a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, <laughs> the world doesn't want him, but chosen of God, precious. Isaiah prophesied about this rock. A prophecy. Look at Isaiah twenty-eight sixteen. Let's get a reader. Proverbs Isaiah twenty-eight sixteen. Anybody who can read, please, or can't read, I don't know. One of you students, read nice and loud over there, Josh. Come on. It's in the Old Testament. A stone. I lay in Zion a foundation stone. What else? 
tried stones, going through trials. Precious, and he's the cornerstone from which all else is measured. No other foundation can any man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 3.11. He's the living stone, the tried stone, the chosen stone. He's the can-do stone. And disallowed indeed of men. Kind of an allusion to the cornerstone of the original temple that was set aside as if it could not be used until someone recognized it fits right in the corner. And so they use that as, he uses that as an illustration. I want you to imagine the Lord holding up all the world's sins. Is he powerful enough to do it? Yes, sir. He's the precious stone. Think about him. And when I'm his and I've tasted that he's gracious, there's something I am committed to doing. Let's go to Romans 6, 1 and 2. Number 3 on your study sheet. Romans 6, 1 and 2. The apostle spent some time explaining that Christ overcame all the problems of sin, including Adam's, chapter 5. That is caused by Adam. And then said that God's grace overcame all of that. And then he anticipated a misunderstanding of that teaching that God's grace could overcome all those problems. Maybe we'll sin more and get more grace. No. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin continue any longer? therein. If you are a saved person, you have, a, you have a commitment. And that is to get out of the habit of sinning, not live in that world. Get away from it. Now we've already said we're not sinless, but we're making an effort to get out of the sinning business. We don't want to continue in that lifestyle. I had a Christian say to me years ago at another congregation, well, that's just the way I am. I said, that will have to change. That's going to have to change. When you have tasted that the Lord is gracious, when you understand what he is and how precious he is, your determination is to become like him, to walk in his light. We will never be perfect. We will always be forgiven. I had a, an uncle, if you gave him a coin, he'd bite it. You know why he bit it? Was he testing his what? Is it genuine? Have you tasted that the Lord is genuine? Then Peter says, you face persecution, but still live like it. We have a commitment to get out of the sinning business. That's just the way I am has to be a changed thought in our minds. These sins he mentions in verses one, verse 1 of chapter 2 are the opposite of what we're talking about here. The Christian cannot partake of malice, guile, hypocrisy, envy, and evil speakings. If he's tasted that the Lord is precious. Number five, it, Peter desired, they desire the sincere milk of the world. I want you to tell me the answer to number six, class. What is it that should cause such a great desire in a Christian to study this word? I told you the other day when I was preaching about the letters Dorothy wrote me. Why did I read them? I love the one that wrote them. No other reason we don't study it. We don't, we're not interested in the one who wrote it. Today in the 2nd Corinthian class, we were talking about 
the sufferings of Paul that abounded, but the comfort even abounded more, as you wrote. But I mentioned something to them that has crossed my mind several times. When I go to the judgment day and I'm standing before him and I've never suffered one thing for him or his cause or his work, aren't I going to be a little bit embarrassed knowing what he did for me? I just thought I'd ask. It takes a little effort to know God's word, but it's worth the effort. Might have you up all night sometimes, that's all right. Human suffering is not always because of his purpose, though. Sometimes we bring it on ourselves. But when you don't suffer for the Lord, maybe you're not living for him. Maybe you're living for the world. Any thoughts about those first four verses there that I haven't shared or something on your mind or question or whatever? Well, number seven has to do with verse five here. Christians are living. The King James has lively, just living stones. We're not concrete blocks. We are built up a spiritual house. If I told you that Dorothy and I quit going to church in 1965, what would you think I meant? I quit attending. No, we attended every service. Wednesday night too. How come I quit going to church in 1965? I am the church in 1965, and I took it to worship. Little trick question there. We have people that think this room is a sanctuary. It's just a room. It's just a room. It's just a room. Nothing sacred about it at all. This is not the church, this building. You folks are the church. Have you ever met someone who said you can't eat in the church? Well, I would. that would be disgusting to crawl inside of a Christian and eat. <laughs> Somebody's got a misunderstanding here of what we are. Peter tells us, he said, you folks are the church. You're the stones in the building. Spiritual building. Look at what else we are, a holy priesthood. Somebody tell me why we have to be, a, why we have to be priests. To approach God, exactly. You can't approach God if you're not a priest or a priestess. Am I allowed to say that in 2022 in America? Do we have women priests and men priests? Do we have men and women in America in 2020? This is a crazy world, isn't it? We have to be a priest to approach God. Everybody here is a priest. That means everybody here, when we sing, has to do what? Sing. When we pray, what? Don't just listen to the fellow praying. Pray. Take the Lord's Supper. Who? All of us priests. Yeah. Otherwise, we can't approach God. And yet there is a religion that has a priest between you and God. Who is he? He's not between me and God. I go directly to God through my high priest. Who's my high priest? Christ. So I'm a priest. Well, that's an interesting thought, isn't it? A holy, set-apart priesthood. For what purpose? Serve the Lord. I've been set apart, sanctified, holy, and look what my job is. I offer up spiritual sacrifices. Let's go over to Hebrews 2 a moment and read about one of those. Spiritual sacrifices. Somebody read verse 12 of Hebrews 2, please. Yeah. 
It's in the church is where we sing praise to God. We are his priests. Now, how do you become a priest of God? Well, you hear about the sacrifice of Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection. You believe it. He died, he was buried, he rose again the third day. Believing those facts leads you to do something. You consider your present mental condition and your activities, and you decide to do something different. You make a change in your mind. You repent. You have made a decision. Whatever God tells me to do, I'm going to do it. The first thing he tells you to do is to stand in front of witnesses and with your mouth confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Acts 8, 37. And when you get through with that confession, you are now ready to be immersed in water by someone but it's not just the immersion. If it were just an immersion, you'd drown. What you have to have is a resurrection. And so we immerse you, and as you come up out of that watery grave, God takes away all of your past sins. Acts twenty-two sixteen. But he doesn't do it before you do that. And so now when you come up out of that water, you're a priest. You're added to the church. Your past sins are forgiven. And as a priest, if you sin now, you have a way to approach him. You repent and ask him in prayer to forgive you. Because you're a priest, you can do that. You have a way to approach God, Acts 8, 22. And so, if you have tasted that the Lord's gracious and you've obeyed the gospel, it's the case that in the church now, you're a priest. And you can offer up spiritual sacrifices. You can give as a priest. Pray as a priest, worship as a priest, and at the same time, you find out these kinds of activities mentioned in his word are acceptable to God because of what Jesus did. Jesus' sacrifice allowed us to become priests of God. Paul, to back up his teaching, or Peter, to back up his teaching here, references the Old Testament. And goes back here to Isaiah that we read just a moment ago. It is contained in the scripture. I hope you'll underline that word scripture. That's the technical word for holy or divine writings, graphe. It is contained in the holy writings, the Old Testament scriptures. Behold, I lay in sign a chief cornerstone, elect chosen by God in the Septuagint, precious, and he that keeps on believing on him shall not be confused or confounded or embarrassed or ashamed. And the Greek says he won't make haste. He'll not have to run away from this kind of thought. My faith in Christ is not something about which I'm ashamed. I'm tasting that the Lord is gracious. He's my chief cornerstone. He's elect to me, chosen of God. He's precious, and I believe him. I'm his priest. In the Old Testament, there was a special class of priests that came out of the family of the brother of Moses. His name was Aaron. All of the following priests had to be related to that family, physically so. Well, today, to be God's priest, you need to be in his family. His family is the Church of Christ. Our only high priest today is Jesus. Let's read that in Hebrews 4, 14 and 15. Our only high priest today is Jesus. I was able to come to the morning services Sunday and then went home to take her Dorothy and Karen came to the afternoon services, my daughter. And she heard a sermon and when she came home, she, she said, Dad, I just can't tell you how great that sermon was. 
she was crying about it. Mar uh, Scott's, sir, Mar sorry about that, Scott. I didn't mean to insult you. Uh, I won't do that. Uh, Scott's sermon was, does Jesus care? Yes, I know he cares. He is, without doubt, special high priest. He knows what I feel. He knows what I suffer. Every feeling I've ever had, he shared it somehow. Every temptation I ever had, he knows it. He knows how to overcome it. He's special. But I want you to notice here what Peter called us. Did you notice that in verse 2 he called us newborn babes? Then he added living stones, verse 5. Then he added priests, verse 5. And so that reminds me of Romans 12, 1 and 2, does it you? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, now watch him, that you present your body, a living, King James has sacrifice, a living offering, not a dead one like the old animals were, a living one. This body is how I present my priestly activities to God. I can't do it any other way. And so he says, you present your bodies a living offering to God, which is your logical service or reasonable service. And then he attacks the way we think. He says, and be not conformed to this world, but be you transported by the... So he takes your mind, renewing your mind, that you may prove what, test what is that good and acceptable will of God. He tells us as priests, involve your body and your mind, because as newborn babes and living stones, you're actually a priest. And you are able to offer up to God things he will accept. I never worry about whether God is accepting my worship from the standpoint of I'm doing what the Bible tells me to do. Because I'm doing exactly what it told me to do and nothing more. It's strange to me that all of those old timers who studied the Bible and came out of denominationalism into the restoration effort gave up the instrument. I wonder why they did that. They read the New Testament. And he said, sing. He didn't say anything else. That's it. Sing. Now, you start doing something else, you stepped outside your priesthood. You can't do that and be a good priest of God and offer yourself as a living offering to God. He wants us, not the instrument, he wants the fruit of my lips, not an instrument. He's not worshiped with my hands as though he needed something. He wants me to offer me to him. That also helps us with this thought, I don't get anything out of worship. You're not supposed to. You're supposed to bring something to it. And so we are priests. And this is an Old Testament concept. Now we're all of us in the New Testament. And so Paul, Peter ends this thought with this. Unto you, therefore, which believe he's precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the, same, the stone which the builders disallowed. Let me tell you something, unbeliever. That didn't stop Jesus. <laughs> that didn't stop him. The builders disallowed the stone. They went ahead and used it anyway. The same, the one you have disallowed, is made the head of the corner. What did the Jews want in a Messiah? A warrior, all right? Did they get one? So to the Jews, he's a stumbling block. He's not that military captain we wanted. What about the Greeks? What was their problem? To the Greeks, foolishness. What they think couldn't happen? And a God would die, right? And so the, to the Jews, he was a stumbling block. To the Greeks, foolishness, 1 Corinthians 1. But what about us? He's a precious cornerstone. A precious cornerstone. He's a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient. And that is the result of, of not obeying the gospel. In the gospel meetings that I was able to hold over the years, I always said something the first Sunday to all that were there. 
I gave them a kind of warning. I said something like this. If you're here this week listening to the gospel and you have no intention of doing it or obeying it, let me warn you about something. That every time you hear it from now on, it will harden your heart even more. That's because it's a two-edged sword. It can cut two different ways. It can prick your heart or cut your heart. If it cuts your heart, it will become more and more callous the more you listen to it and the less you decide to obey it. You just become harder and harder. It probably would be better for you not to have known the way of truth, <laughs> as Peter said. But nevertheless, there is a warning here. They are appointed because that's the consequence of not obeying the gospel. The Calvinists will read this verse and say, See, God chose some to be lost and some to be saved. No, it's not what Peter meant. He's telling us the consequence of being an unbeliever. And finally, he tells us, You're a chosen generation. Here's your four descriptions. Have you ever been... When you were young, how many of you played some kind of a, like baseball or basketball or something? Did you ever get to be the one that they left out when they were choosing? We used to do this thing with a baseball bat. Did you do it? Where you, I always put my hand on the top of it. You ever left out, Scott? I was too. My basketball coach told me, he said, Mosier, you might be slow, but at least you're awkward. I wasn't too good at, I wasn't any good at all at basketball. Anyways, I'm not left out of this one. Did you notice what he called us? If you've never been chosen for anything, you have been by the Lord, and you can't get a better choice than, chooser than that. You're a chosen person, a royal priesthood. I'll have to stop there. He's opening the door back here. A holy nation, and let's underline the word peculiar and translate it, a people who belong especially to God, a people for God's own possession, as the American Standard has it. We are a special people. What's our task as priests? Watch. Show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness and do his marvelous light. Thank you for your kind attention tonight.